What's up, everybody? Eric here, and I'm back with my friend Tom Basso, although your name says Thomas, which is very formal, but it's good to have you back again. Welcome to the Outlier Podcast. It's great to have you on again. Hey, good to be here, Eric. So this year, last year, it's been super busy. And from a kind of macro level standpoint, it seems like the market is in this transition period, whether or not we hold here, move higher, hold here, start to collapse down. What are your thoughts on where we stand in the markets literally right now? Well, you're, you're speaking of the stock market, no doubt. <clears throat> you have to remember, I trade 26 futures markets. I trade, you know, anything from metals, currencies, uh, ag products, uh, meats and so on softs. Uh, so a lot of markets are going through transitions. I would say that earlier in the year, <clears throat> I saw a lot of commodity markets tending to um, do all right. They were starting to get the inflation thing going. There were some disruptions. There was some drought in the ag area. In the case of the stock market itself, you sort of had a really lousy last year. And then you transition to uh, this sort of we're going to have a recession and we're going to at the same time the fed is going to absolutely clamp down on inflation so uh people didn't trust the rally um i think we could take a little side trip for the traders that would be watching this down the road and say that this is a great example of why you shouldn't predict you shouldn't try to guess what's going to happen because the vast majority of traders, I think, guessed that we were going to have either a recession and therefore the stock market will be weak, or we're going to have the Fed just uh, killing all the joy with higher interest rates. And uh, so they stood, they stood aside and just were absolutely convinced that this thing is not going to rally. And I've been, I took the hedges off, I don't even remember now, January, February or something, a long, long time ago. And I've been unhedged and just almost fully invested the whole way, doing very well, had a great year so far. And I don't, I didn't predict it. I mean, I would have said that I would have agreed with everybody's predictions, but from a trader's viewpoint, I don't worry about what I think the market's gonna do. I look at the prices, it cuts through the indicator, hits my stops, I'm long move the stops up when you can, control your position sizes and risk, and, and wash, wash, rinse, and repeat, you know, over and over again for the last 50 years, you know. And um, so it, it becomes about as easy as breathing at this point. But um, I think that that's the, what I've seen now. And, now. and now we're getting to the point where uh, I'm starting to see some uh, cracks in the foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm seeing out of my nine strategies, one of them dedicates itself to being long or short NQ, which would be NASDAQ futures, either long or short. And it's uh, the indicators I use there are nine day indicators. And so it's a little shorter term than shorter a lot term, yeah. of my long term sector timing or my uh, more longer term uh, futures trading is so I, I kind of call it sort of intermediate term because I have one other program that I'm down in the two to three year or two to three day uh, time frame but this nine day indicator is already going over to the to the downside I'm short NK futures I've sold off I was fully invested uh, 30 out of 30 for at least a few days in the sector timing so that's 30 different sectors all stocks with uh, one, is that right? Yeah, one uh, bond fund is in there. So mm. 29 stocks and one bond. And out of those now, we've backed off to 27 out of 30. So that's starting to go, you know, it's starting to sell itself off. And uh, we're getting pretty close now if you look at my hedge chart on enjoytheride.world, my website on the hedge page, you'll see the uh, stops on my new hedge going on keep coming up higher and higher and the market keeps going lower and lower. And they look like they're going to come close to each other here in another few days or a week, hard to say. 
So I'm keeping my eye on it because if uh, that goes over, I'm now fully hedged and I'll take off that amount of risk. So, uh, and at that point, who knows, you know, things starts rolling downward and people get panicked and uh, all these people who have now predicted that we're not going to have a recession and we're definitely going to have a soft landing and the Fed are, is not going to raise anymore, might find themselves completely wrong again and then scrambling to uh, get out of the get out of the kitchen because it's too hot. Yeah, and it's interesting because the you know probabilistic outcome right now on futures shows another increase, and it's slowly starting to change. For a while, it was no change, and it's slowly starting to ratchet up for another increase. But you mentioned one thing on the bond funds, which um, or bond index that made me want to ask you: What do you think about thirty-year Treasury yields right now? They had that that giant pop. And I thought that was really interesting movement. Obviously, there's a little bit of impact coming in from the Fed and, you know, removing liquidity. But I'm curious, like, what do you make of that movement? Because essentially, you know, looking at the beginning of July, it was, you know, 38.43, and now it's up at like 43. So it's a pretty meaningful move. Yeah, I would say bonds in general, though, have had, if you think about it, close to 40 years of the wind at their back, <clears throat> going back to Reaganomics in 1980. And just recently, in the last few years, with the inflation and the fighting inflation and the Fed increasing the rates and all that, bonds have had the wind in their face. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, where are we on the whole scheme of things? I don't see inflation going away anytime soon. I mean, a lot of people predict it's sticky. My, uh, I, guess, I guess, elementary level economics brain tells me that we're probably going to be uh, fighting inflation for some time. I don't think it'll ever get to, unless we get into a, like a depression or something, maybe it just collapses and we're all in, uh, then you're, you're going to want your uh, 40 acres in the woods. Um, but other than that type of scenario, I don't see in any normal times interest rates going down a huge amount. I could see them going up more to fight inflation that we continue to have and continues to seem sticky. So I think bonds are, uh, I wouldn't want to have a lot of, uh, a lot of money in them right now. I think the, the return to risk could be lousy. Right. And you bring up another point that's actually the note that I was jotting down. I'd love to get your perspective. The tightening cycle that we went through with the Fed is uh, unprecedented. It's literally one of the first series that we've seen like that. And I am very curious. It's easy to say the Fed's stupid. The Fed doesn't know what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like everybody just complains about the Fed. But like, they're not dumb. They're doing the best they can with a lot of information. They're obviously arguably, a little late to the party. But when we're looking at the way that this continues forward, Powell has been very steady on the drumbeat of we're going to continue tightening until the job is done. How do you view that kind of phrasing against some of the early cracks we started to see in the banking sector? And then at what point would you imagine the Fed would say, I understand this is my silver bullet, but I'm breaking everything with it. When when does that happen? And then what happens at that juncture? Yeah, I would also be a Fed basher. I think they waited too long to do anything. And I think yeah. that's partially a political problem. They seem to uh, be political animals more and more. They used to be more independent back when I was a lot younger. Uh, nowadays, it seems as though they're just trying to always... Uh, act in political fashions. And, and so they're too late to take action against inflation. And they're probably going to be too late or overdo it to the other side too. And they're, they're going to be panicking when they start seeing some big banks going to trouble. And they're going to have to scramble and say, oh, I guess we ought to ease back a little bit. We've overdone it. And they'll probably be too late doing that too. They're, they seem to be looking in the rear view mirror as they drive. Um, so I don't know. I I think that 
I agree that he has been, uh, Powell, that is, has been very consistent with the message. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's good because half of his job is convincing others that they're serious about whatever it is that they're trying to talk about. Uh, if he doesn't stay consistent with his message, he'll get ripped apart uh, and probably replaced by somebody who can stay consistent to his message. Um, yeah, I just think... Um, got a tough job because they've painted themselves into the corner. They have allowed inflation to rear its ugly head. And at the same time, they have expanded their book to the point where they need to start backing off the book and sell that stuff. And when they sell stuff like that, they are taking money out of the money supply and so that's sort of a double whammy. If they keep the interest rates high and are reducing the money supply, you're going to choke any chance that you would have to get the economy rolling. And growth of the economy, in my mind, is the only logical, a super good way to lift all everybody's incomes across all sorts of sectors of the economy. Uh, to have a growing economy. And what I see happening in Washington with uh, Congress and the administration, along with what I see happening with the Fed, all speaks to killing the growth in the economy. And that's not going to be a long-term recipe for success, sadly. One of the questions I'm kind of really curious about here is, last week we had some, or was it last week or the week before, we had some pretty good wage numbers come out. And then today we had CPI, PPI come out and CPI looked okay. It, I have the same sensation as you do in terms of the overall assessment that I have, but I am surprised to see continued economic resilience thus far at least. What do you make of kind of the dichotomy between those two? Uh, sort of momentum, I think. Uh, people get into a habitual lifestyle and it takes some pain or some shock. Like, you know, you take the stock market, for instance, and let's say people are used to just lately clicking along and making 10, mm -hmm. 20, 30%. Uh, all you got to do is throw on uh, October 19th, 1987, that I experienced firsthand as a money manager into the mix where the stock market goes down by 23% or something in one day. And now you got circuit breakers. I understand all that good stuff, but let's say it goes down 40% in, in uh, what, two weeks. Would that shock the world? Yeah, it would. Would it probably change people's plans? You know, instead of buying that second home, maybe we just hunker down now and everything just kind of, Let's get a little bit closer to home. Let's make sure our family's okay. Let's not take that extravagant vacation to Europe. All of a sudden, um, your decisions start changing slightly. And that's that can happen very quick and across an entire economy. And especially with the, the immediacy of, you know, we could be doing, you and I could be, you're in San Diego, I'm in, in the mountains of Arizona. And we're chatting like we're right in the same room. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted to, we could be doing this live on like a Twitter live feed or something. I have a couple Saturdays ago, I was on uh, an interview session where I think he said there was something like 10,000 people signed up for it all around the world. Crazy. And uh, so you get that word out and the panic starts to spread. Man, you look out, it could happen just like a wildfire in the wind. Right. How do you think about your positioning here? For me, very similar to you, I've been like quite utilized most of the year, but when we come into times like this, especially over the last month, I've been pretty selective. I still have risk out, I'll continue to maintain risk out, but I don't know the way you think about rotating your risk or is it just rotating in between your different strategies here? No, what I I already preset all of the commitments to each of the nine strategies. Then what I do to 
control the risk on an ongoing basis is to control the exposure to risk and volatility by mm -hmm. way of my position sizing covered in my position sizing book, successful traders size their positions, why and how. Uh, the actual formulas are in there. It's easy to use. I don't think twice about it. And then I just keep in times where it seems to be transitioning like this. If you think about it, I've built up larger and larger risk structures because of the profits, the profitable moves that I've been in. So as those get over a certain level, and it's different for every single strategy and different for every all sorts of different markets, but each specific strategy has its own level of a allowable risk. Got it. So let's take an example of in my futures trading, I would have like a half a percent risk to get into the position. And I would allow each position to grow to be 1% of my portfolio risk, as long as that was due to profits. And my stop is struggling to keep up with how fast I'm making money. So then what I do is as soon as it gets to 1% or higher, I peel off however many positions and futures that I need to, to get back down to 1% allowable. So as markets like what we've experienced this year have come along, I've just been reducing position sizes. Now that solves part of the problem. Second part of the problem is solved in my mind, or it, at least it's addressed by continuing to have movable tra uh, trailing stops that are large logical. I'm giving the market enough room. And if the market becomes more volatile, I give it plenty of space. I use things like ATR, average true range to try to measure the volatility and keep my stops at least a volatility or sometimes two times volatility away from where the market is. And that is usually sufficient to stay out of the noise. But as the market keeps rolling along like it has been, I keep moving those stops up. So I'm moving the stops up. I'm peeling positions off. I'm always getting ready. And I've those stops, so in many cases, are stop and reverse. As soon as those stops are hit, I'm now short. Well, as you have nine strategies and some like uh, NQ futures now are already short, but I'm 27 out of 30 long on my sector timing, I'm starting to get a mixed bag. So it transitions myself automatically and I don't even have to think about it. And it sounds like the beauty there too, obviously, is by having those kind of balanced deltas, obviously you're managing the size and whatnot. It's still, it stays true to your roots, right? You're, you're making sure that you have some protection against systematic risk. Um, yeah. 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 When you think about whenever this unwind comes from the Fed, what trading themes come to mind for you when that inevitably does occur? Well, if you're talking the interest rates staying yes, firm sir. and high. Yep. Uh, I wouldn't say bonds would be a great place unless you're just trying to find a place to park cash. I would keep it on short-term bonds, not long-term. If anything, one year or less maturity in my mind. Um, what themes come to mind? Um, you know, well, one thing that strikes me that's been uh, decent and could get exciting if it broke out would be the crypto futures could be an mm -hmm. interesting game to play because there's no really limit on how much they could move. And they've been very volatile and volatile instruments tend to be a trader's best friend because after all, we all have to buy and we have to sell. And the farther and faster something moves, the more profitable it can be if you're on the right side of it. So I'd be watching those markets for starters. I like silver. It seems to move quickly. And if we have a situation where inflation is persistent, perhaps that could have a move. Right now, it's not. It's on the downside. Uh, but it could perk up and people could get excited about that, especially if the stock market was selling off and people thought, all right, the world's going to an end. I better buy gold now or something. Uh, that might be another play. Energy uh, seems to be the way I'm trading uh, unleaded gas, I'm trading uh, natural gas futures, and I'm trading mini crude oil futures. And all three of those look like they have the potential to be headed upward now. And uh, they 
I could see where if we have an inflationary environment, you got the, the price of the commodities products, the, the energy products could easily go up against a dollar uh, going down, inflation reducing the value of the dollar. Uh, the only thing that is the caveat there is you could have a, uh, if you do get a recession, you get a slowdown in the economy, then all of a sudden people don't need oil. Uh, during COVID, uh, oil got to a negative price uh, because there was nobody using the stuff. Nobody they want, yeah, they didn't want to store it out of storage. So it became a, a problem. And uh, for a few days, it actually went negative on the future. So those are some areas to watch. Um, you know, as usual, what I do is I just have my indicators already onto those markets. And hey, if they start caving in and going south, I'm short. And if they continue on the upside, I continue to be long and move my stops control my position sizes. It's like a broken record. I'm I'm not doing anything today different than what I did during say the COVID crash or the COVID recovery or you know the markets in 2019. Uh I do the same thing every day. So and do you, do you create like a broad market thesis as a backdrop and then look at the individual sectors or is it just specific to each individual sector? I kind of get a broad market read a little bit by how the different time frames I'm measuring the stock market in some of the strategies and how I end up long or short. You know, I can see situations where right now sector timing, which is a longer term, is still clinging to the upside 27 out of 30. But the nine day um, NASDAQ, which has been a little weaker than some of the other indexes anyway, like Russell and those. Yep. Uh, the Dow has been uh, probably the strongest, I think, the last few days. Uh, out of all the other indexes, the NASDAQ's been the weakest, and not surprisingly, it kicked through its stop losses, and uh, my it, it took me short. So I've now got some short, I've got some long, I can see the transition sort of occurring. I don't have to predict it, it just sort of happens naturally. I see. And then when you're using kind of your your sector themes, what time frames do you typically play with those? Uh, that's also on the hedge page. I use the same indicators I use for the hedges. So it'd be three different indicators. It'd be uh, Keltner, Donchin, yep. and Bollinger. And I would use 21 days and uh, 2.3 times the Keltner, 2.0 times the Bollinger, and just the str <clears throat> straight 21 days Donchin to give me my upside uh, buy signal for my sectors. And then I, uh, because the stock market is upwardly biased over the very long term due to inflation and declining value of the dollar and everything, in my opinion, I use a 50 day indicator to get out, same indicators. So I just change the 21 to 50 and I run it that way. So I lean towards the upside more than I lean towards the downside. But if it's a bad bear market, I want to I want to get out of this stuff. Right. And then you, you even those indicators themselves, right? They integrate a lot of volatility to them. Do you isolate and trade volatility itself as well? Nope. Got it. Just through the products. All of those indicators and everything I do has an aspect of volatility to it. And I try to control that because I don't want my portfolio in retirement uh, keeping me up at night. So I, I try to be careful on how much exposure I have to volatility and to risk. Uh, so that's, I think, part of the reason for my consistency over, what, 50 years of trading now. Uh, I think you have to be able to maintain that and have the mental, you either have to be you know, have a, a lead line stomach and uh, a real, real need for excitement and stress uh, to to leverage yourself and to be put in high risk situations and try to make as much money as you possibly can and be stressed out all the time. But if you're going to be Mr. Serenity, <laughs> you have to, you have to, uh, control your risk of volatility. You have to make sure you're very diversified at any one day. I mean, I never have all 50 to 60 positions going in my favor or against me. It's always right. a mixed bag. And I'm just looking to try to make that 
that total number when the portfolio is all added up, uh, green as many days as I can. I run, uh, I keep track of the last running year uh, on a spreadsheet every afternoon. I'm running about 51% of the days uh, I have profitability. Got so it. That's more yeah. than half. If I can make my days that are profitable larger than my negative days, and I'm running over 50% profitable days, you know, that's, I think you're erring on the correct side and it keeps life pretty simple and easy. It seems like the Mr. Serenity theme would apply pretty cleanly there. Yeah. Um, exactly. Another thing I wanted to ask you is when it came to your hedging, do you, with a book of 50, 60 positions, whatever it is, do you prefer to hedge in the individual positions or do you apply some sort of broader portfolio hedge against like a weighted you know, yeah, what I do there is I'll take uh, the my largest exposure long term on the equities market would be the sector. I use sector ETFs, and I do that okay. simply because, I mean, I could obviously go out and buy the Amazons and the Metas and all that and deal with it. But what I'm seeing in my later years here, the last say five or ten, is you're seeing uh, you're seeing individual securities have just an earnings announcement or you know it could be lukewarm or their their uh, prediction for the next quarter isn't as ebullient as it was the the quarter before or something and all of a sudden boom down 17 percent on the open it's insane now some of these issues have lots of volume i could get in and out i could try to diversify that away by running some automated strategies in the stock area and let's say I had a 50 stock portfolio. Well, then I could diminish some of that corporate risk so that if a stock went down 20% on the open, it would only be one fiftieth of my portfolio or something like that. And I could deal with it and, and I could do that. But it just seems to me that if I instead want some tech stocks, I could go do XLK as a spider. It's the technology spider. And now I, I own all of these stocks and I don't have that corporate risk anymore. I just have an ETF that has a focus on technology. I buy it when it breaks out to the upside and I sell it when it goes to the downside. Now to answer your hedging question then, if I have 20, or excuse me, 30 different sectors of all these things that range from energy sectors to even a junk bond sector, international, uh, small cap, uh, large caps, um, entered um, you know, agricultural, all sorts of different sectors, I can be long or I can go to cash on all of those. Well, as we start getting the stock market to cave in, the hedges go on. What I'm doing there is I'm using an ES index, broadly diversified index, short, to go against all these individual sectors long. So what, the way I do that is I look at what my exposure is the day I have to put the hedge on. And let's say I'm now down to, I don't know, 21 out of 30 sectors. I calculate what that exposure is and I put on a hedge that balances that and I'm essentially out of the market. Got it. Yeah. Do it with one, rather than do individual trades times 21, I can do one trade and get a pretty good clamping down on risk with just one trade. It's super simple. Yeah, and that's actually the particular reason why I asked that question. So I know a lot of people that listen to this, they tend to manage smaller books, right? A lot of newer retail traders, they're probably sure. 15 positions or less, but I think it's good for them to understand some of the, the trade-offs that come when you can kind of create inherent diversification via all of the products you carry. But like you said, if we wanted direct hedges, sure, they're slightly more accurate, but then you have to run through all of these products and hedge them individually. Well, Whereas and you also have to be careful tax-wise in the U.S. Uh, if mm -hmm. you hedge something directly, then you could get into strange situations where the IRS could say, and I'm not a tax expert, so let's add that disclaimer. Don't take this. Ask your own tax advisor to see if I'm correct. But it seems to me that that becomes the equivalent of possibly selling your position out. And then mm -hmm. the IRS says, well, you know, you hedged it. So you had zero risk and no chance for anything other than zero risk. So therefore, we're going to say you really sold that stock, even though you didn't. 
and we want a, our piece of the action. In my case, I've got, you know, 21 sector funds or something, 30, whatever I have at, at the moment. And then I got a, a short sell position in a, in a standard Porsche 500 futures. Those are completely different things. However, my analysis of how the stock market has been correlated over my lifetime, if you looked at international stocks, all the stocks in the world, let's say, you probably were down when I first started in the business back in the late 70s, early 80s. You probably were down in the 60 something percent correlations around the world, especially if you had international stocks in the mix. You're approaching 85 plus now. Mm. The stocks in the world are no longer diversified. And I think it's largely because we have so many of these broad based indexes now, and all these stocks are part of these indexes. And there's lots of index funds that have tons of money that they have to go out and buy all these issues and put them in the indexes in the ETFs and all that stuff. So everything's just becoming correlated and it's hard to find a lack of correlation to truly be diversified in a straight stock portfolio long only. But if I know that most stocks, like if we go into a, let's say a, a 2000 where a tech stocks go down 80%, on the NASDAQ uh, and you know that, that hurts pretty badly. If you're short the NASDAQ against the tech stock portfolio, you're just kind of doing okay. You know, you might right. lose a little, you might make a little even. The NASDAQ index futures short might make more than your portfolio loses and you might come out a little ahead on the deal. On the day of the uh, crash of 87, we were managing a pension plan that I put in my book, uh, The All-Weather Trader. I, I cited this example. Uh, we were short well before uh, going into the uh, crash day. And we had the portfolio. It was a couple million dollar portfolio of stocks completely hedged. And we ended up at the end of the day of the crash in that portfolio ahead about a fraction of 1%. So the hedge worked pretty well actually made a little more on the hedge than we lost on the portfolio. And, you know, that's what you can achieve with one position. You just knock down your risk. It's hard to, with a, a huge portfolio, a couple million dollars, lots and lots of positions to try to sell out all that and take taxable consequences is very difficult. And especially if some of the issues don't trade a lot. We were into some small cap stuff at that point. That was our specialty, and you don't have the liquidity, but you have a liquidity in ES futures multiple times per second. No problem. What, what do you think of small caps kind of so far this year, but then also looking forward? It seems like, you know, persistent inflation would obviously hurt smaller companies like that pretty meaningfully, but a lot of people are speculating that the unwind will, you know, really lift them up a bit. Is that kind of what you're seeing or something else? I, I like to think that a small company, and I was one when I was a money manager, I had 10 employees. I was small. I think there's a, the flexibility to do things a lot quicker and a lot faster and a little more innovative. You don't have to answer to you know, a board of directors and a committee of 10 trying to opine on every aspect of this particular decision. So there's a lot of advantage that a small company has uh, versus a larger competitor. The large competitor, on the other hand, has staying power, financing, um, expertise, perhaps in-house that they don't have to go outside of house to uh, get. And so they can tend to squash some small competitors um, so the way I like to think of small cap stocks is if they're just in a the same industry and, and competing for the same product and it's a generic product of some sort, there's nothing special there. I, I lean towards the liquidity of the larger company because I think that then you have that ability to survive perhaps tough times. On the other side of it, uh, if you have a small company that has done something like a niche, you know, like back in the days of COVID, Zoom became a household. It's now 
you know, not if we're going to do a, a teleconference call, it's are we going to Zoom? It's almost become like Xerox. You became right. copying something. You Xeroxed it. Uh, even though Xerox was a brand name, you were Xeroxing the piece of paper. And uh, hell, down in the, the South, my wife is fond. She's from Jackson, Mississippi originally. And she's fond of telling me that when you, uh, in my Northern New York terms, uh, would say that you'd want a soda pop, no, in the South, you get a Coke. <laughs> right, right. What kind you of Coke? you want a 7-Up yeah. yep. or do you want a Dr. Pepper or you want a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi? But they're all Cokes. Right. Uh, and so I think that's what we face with uh, small cap is finding those interesting stories that are supplying a niche that the big guys haven't figured out yet. Those are the ones that are really the, you know, the thousand baggers that you can really do very well with and establish long-term positions. So those are the ones I would always try to seek out if I was trying to go into small cap land. Got it. I know we're coming up on time here, um, but do you trade orange juice futures? Yes. What What's going on there? I was looking at the movement. I don't trade orange juice futures myself very much, but I can't help but not see that move and follow the move at this point. But what do you like? Yeah, what's the deal? Um, I I'm not a fundamentalist, so I'll be just taking some pot sh pot guesses at this. Uh, uh, but there's two things that seems to always affect the uh, long term of orange juice. Number one, it's the weather in Florida during the winter because it seems like perpetually I, all the trips I've ever made to Orlando. I'd get there in the middle of January or something and a frost hits and everybody's got the smudge pots out and they're trying to warm up the air over top of the orange crop, the orange trees. And then invariably you'd get these issue, these super winter freezes that would knock out whatever, 20% to pick a number, 10, 20% of all the, the orange trees would just die. They can't take the cold. Right. So then what usually happens, because Florida is so is growing so fast, is you know, if the orange grove happens to be on the outskirts of Orlando, the guy says, you know, I'm tired of doing the farming thing and losing 10, 20% of my orange crop every so often. This isn't worth it. My property is now worth millions. I can retire and go I buy a place in the Bahamas and uh, enjoy life. I'm done with this. And so one more orange crop goes. So long term, what ends up happening is the the amount of orange crop keeps kind of struggling to, to be as prolific as it, it was back in the day. So I think those two factors are creating a lot of uncertainty in exactly the supply and demand of orange juice. And uh, I think there's been some nice moves. So traders that like to just measure a trend and go with it, it's been very, very good this year, both up and down. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, cause it, it popped up back like early this year. I want to say like February, March, where it had like that one just vertical set. And then I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And then ever since then, I watched it march from 200 to over 300 over the course of, you know, like March to now. And I was like, man. Yeah, one of, one of my posts on Twitter back in probably February or right in there when it was going vertical was, uh, Orange juice futures remind me of a B-22 taking off at a, after a Chinese spy balloon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it takes yeah, off, hits the afterburners, and that's kind of the way the chart looked. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we let the spy balloon just drift across the entire country, but, you yeah. know, that's a whole other story. Well, well, when we want to take it out, it's done. Pretty quick. Well, Tom... Thank you so much for hanging out. Like I said, it's always fun. It's really cool getting your perspective on a lot of these different products. You maintain exposure to a lot of things. So I love not only being able to pull into your breadth of experience, but obviously your depth because you've been at this for a really long time. So thank you for hanging out on the Outlier podcast. Where can people get a hold of you? Obviously, enjoy the ride.world, which will be in the links below. Anything yeah. else that you want to throw in there? 
Yeah, the website is full of, and sometimes free information. All the interviews I've ever done that I got a recording of are on there. Uh, this one will be on there if you share it with me. Uh, and uh, then uh, Twitter is probably my biggest exposure to social media. I think I have 51,000 or so uh, followers on Twitter. And that's just at Vaso underscore Tom. That's easy. Uh, I'm also decently sized on Facebook, probably three, 4,000 people there. Just look for enjoytheride.world and uh, you'll find the page. Just follow it. You'll get all my posts on Facebook. And then LinkedIn, I'm also on. Uh, just search for my name and you'll find me. And, yeah, uh, and I'll grab links to all of those to throw in the show notes below. This way people can easily get a hold of you, tap in your wisdom. And yeah, thanks for hanging out and looking forward to catching up with you again in a few months. Hey, Eric, it was fun. Take care. Bye.